Hi, welcome to Module 7 and Lecture 9. Having gone through the general topics in, in um, continuous distributions, we're now going to conclude this lecture with a series of three modules covering specific continuous distributions that occur a lot in practice in the social sciences. The first one we're going to talk about is what we're going to talk about right now, this module, which is the normal distribution. So the normal or Gaussian distribution they mean the same thing. It's what often you have seen um, referred to as a bell curve. It's not the best terminology because a bell curve, um, lots of things can be a bell curve. The binomial distribution we saw earlier was a bell curve, looked like a bell, and not all normal distributions look like a bell. So a bell curve is not necessarily the best possible way of talking about this. Nevertheless, it's a common way of talking about it and it's probably the way you've heard about it before because a lot of normal distributions do look like bells, you know, like things like that. Okay. Um, but typically referred to more formally as the normal or the Gaussian distribution. Okay, what is this thing? Well, bef um, so let's write out the equation first and get to what it means later. This is the equation for the PDF of the normal distribution. It has two parameters mu, which is the mean, and sigma squared, which is the variance. Sigma is the standard deviation. Um, these parameters are independent, so the mu and the, and, and the sigma can be picked separately. They don't, they're, not, they're not interact in any way. Compare that to, say, the Poisson distribution, where the variance was the same as the um, mean. Here, that's not the case. The um, the variance, the mean are completely independently settable. You can pick either pick anything you want for either one of them, and they have no um, relationship at all. Okay. So that's the normal. We often write if a variable is distributed according to a normal, we can write x is distributed, that tilde is distributed according to n mu sigma squared that says x is distributed according to a normal distribution with a mean mu and dv and a variance sigma squared again with the standard deviation sigma. Oftentimes we see the standard normal used because you can transform this normal into a standard normal, creating what's called a z-score by making z equal x minus mu over sigma. If you plug it in, you get negative um, z squared over two, and you can rewrite the whole thing as one over the square root of two pi. The sigma squared goes away um, when you change the variables and you just get z squared over two. This is a standard normal distribution. We would say z is distributed with n zero one. And this thing is actually used so commonly, it has its own name, which means equals. Phi of z here is the function name often applied to the standard normal distribution PDF. Now, these are the distributions, the PDFs, now the CDFs are um, obtained by integrating the PDFs, right, from, for the standard one, for instance, from negative infinity to some particular value of z, you would integrate phi of z prime dz prime to distinguish, remember the balance must be different from the integrand, the variable of integration. Problem is this thing right here, as I as mentioned before, has no actual closed form analytic solution. I can't write down a function for this. I can just talk about it. Um, it does have a name. We often refer to this as capital phi for the CDF. Thing is, we can't, and it's very important, we can't actually compute, um, provide a closed form solution to this. We can numerically compute it. All these tables of z-scores you see in stats books in the back are just tables of the CDF of the standard normal distribution. These z's are called z-scores because you convert um, the x you get into uh, into units of standard deviations. So you can tell you so you can say how far you are from the mean of zero. Um, how many standard deviations are you from that mean? The normal distribution has some nice properties. You can specify the percentage of probability between plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two, it's about 68 and 95% respectively, um, and three is about 99%. You will learn all this stuff in stats classes a lot. Um, since this is not a class in inference, we're gonna talk too much about this. 
But this is the normal distribution, and we will talk a little bit about it in terms of why we care about this so much. Well, um, the major reason, besides the nice mathematical properties that say you can distinguish exactly what probabilities are in each um, standard deviation, so let me actually draw that out. So if I had a normal distribution, that's kind of like that, right? If this is plus or minus one standard deviation, right? And this is the mean. So this should really be plus mu, plus mu, or for standard normal. I don't know why that would just. Was, <laughs> um, if this is zero, that's one. This negative one. Pretend this is a bell curve. There's a sixty-eight percent chance of being in here, shaded region. A 95% chance of being in here, approximately, somewhere in any of this blue. And there's a 99% chance of being somewhere in here. And that turns out to be pretty nice um, to figure things out. And it has some other nice properties. When you take an exponential and multiply them together, you, sum the, you end up summing the exponents. It has nice properties. But beyond that, the reason we care so much about these things is um, the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem can be spoken of in a couple of ways, um, well, many, many ways, but two, two primary ways we talk about it is in terms of averages and sums. The way you see most in stats is in terms of the sampling distribution, which is the distribution of the sample me of the means of samples you might take um, of a particular underlying process, right? So when we take data, you're taking a sample of some underlying process of some underlying population. That sample is a mean. The sampling distribution is the distribution of those sample means. And the central limit theorem in this context says that as the size of the samples gets larger, the distribution of all the sample means of the sampling distribution converges to the to a normal distribution. What that means is, despite the fact that the individual samples might have very odd distributions. The population might have an odd distribution as well. The, the distribution of the sample means is going to end up approximating a normal distribution with all these nice properties. And because we often are taking samples and looking at sample means, we often need to use this standard, the um, normal distribution to analyze the distribution of sample means because oftentimes we're trying to compare, we're trying to figure out whether or not a particular sample's mean is sufficiently far from the, the assumed population mean so as to be considered not arising from that distribution. Right, so if you have a sampling distribution like this, like a normal, and you think the population means over here, and you draw a sample mean way over here, then you can ask, what's the chance that I got the sample mean from this sampling distribution? From this distribution, if that chance is sufficiently low, then you believe that the, this, that sample did not actually come from this underlying population, and we don't so we, and we reject the null hypothesis that it did come from the underlying population. Instead, we believe we get support for the conjecture that that sample actually came from a different population with a different mean um, than this one. Typically, we, we let this mean be zero, and if this sample mean is sufficiently high, we say that it came from a, a um, population with a mean different from zero. So that's a very rough, very quick overview of we most often see the normal distribution because this thing is distributed normally. Um, the understanding of how likely it is to have seen this sample mean can be computed given the normal distribution's CDF. Okay, so that's the most common use in general. The normal distribution applies to situations in which you have the arithmetic mean, the, the average of a whole bunch of independently distributed random variables and trying to average them up. That's very similar to the, this um, notion of sampling distributions, um, sample means. And because we often have a lot of things happening together, um, we often see the normal distribution popping up and you have a lot of, you have a sum of a lot of independently distributed actions, um, things, anything. Um, when you add them all together, that thing is distributed normally, approximately normally, and therefore you see the normal distribution a lot in statistics. That's been less true um, recently as people have recognized that even though it's a common distribution, it's not the only distribution. 
and there are other processes that produce different distributions. And as computers have gotten better, people have been better, more able to actually go through and compute appropriate, using appropriate distributions for their particular case of inference. Um, and that, so, so we've seen less normal distribution use, but still a lot of it. It's still extremely common. By far the most common distribution you're going to see, by far the most common continuous distribution you will see in stats. That said, it's not that commonly used in game theory. We've already kind of discussed the reason for this. We talked about the uniform distribution, and the reason is in game theory you often want closed form analytic solutions to things. You want to know that my equilibrium is something, some function f. And as we noted here, the normal distribution um, CDF does not actually admit any closed form solution. And in game theory, when you're comparing different payoffs, as we saw when we talked about expected utility, you effectively use the CDF of the distribution. And if you can't compute the CDF, you can't come up with the closed form distribution. So game theory rarely uses the normal distribution. Um, that said, other um, things that don't require a closed form solution like computational modeling can more easily admit the use of the normal distribution when appropriate. Okay. So that covers the normal distribution. Partially because the normal distribution is so common there have been a bunch of other distributions used to transform existing data into something more closely approximating a normal distribution. You might run into um, paratransformed distributions or um, log normal distributions. Um, you can write the equations in for those as well. For the, for the um, paratransformed, you get this. E to the negative x to the lambda plus mu squared over two sigma squared. Um, so basically you, you, put a, you put a power of x in the exponent and you um, have to have this lambda x to the lambda minus one so you can integrate it correctly. If you recall um, back when we did substitution um, in the integration um, lectures, the, the, the module on substitution, you have to make sure that the derivative of the thing in the exponent is multiplying the, the, um, function, the whole function itself. Here, the, the um, thing in the exponent is x to lambda. The derivative of x to lambda is lambda times x to lambda minus one. So that way, you're multiplying the function by its derivative. When you substitute, you're going to substitute in u equals x to lambda here. Um, but don't try that because you still can't do this integral <laughs> um, using that technique. It just helps you get to the point where you can then do a contour integral. <laughs> but don't worry about that um, right now. The other one is a log normal distribution. And there you have an x in the bottom. Same thing otherwise with a log. It's a natural log, but whatever. Um, mu squared or two sigma squared. And again, the one over x occurs because the derivative of the log is one over x. Um, these are the different distributions that used to be pretty commonly used, but have come out of favor a bunch as people started using distributions when they, when they saw, so let me back up. Um, Oftentimes, people would see, just see data that seem kind of skewed. So one side, so there's, say, an asymmetry. Um, the normal distribution is has no, zero, zero skewness. It's completely symmetric around the mean. If your data looks skewed, people might try to transform it to get more closely to the normal. But then people started paying more attention to the fact that maybe perhaps it wasn't actually a normal distribution that's messed up, but actually a different distribution entirely. And so they fit it to that distribution instead. But you still occasionally see these kind of distributions arise, so it's useful to, to, to have seen them. And we can actually listen to some pictures here. So here's um, page 260 of this printing here. There's um, a few pictures of the normal distribution for different parameter values. You can see it gets um, narrow or wide. And then there are also pictures of paratransformed normal right there on the left. See, it actually shifts um, a whole bunch, both um, skewness and position. Um, and the log normal is very skewed over here, you can see. Um, so that is basically it um, for normal distributions. The next one we're going to cover another really commonly used distribution, the logistic distribution. Thank you very much.